You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Join us now for the expert source for inside information on the options markets. It's time for Options Insider Radio with your host, Mark Longo. Welcome back to Options Insider Radio, the interview program here on the old network where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of options and derivatives and indeed beyond and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you, the listener. My name is Mark Longo from the old optionsinsider.com. And if you sound a little bit different, it's because we'll be coming at you, not from our studio, but no, from the trading show here in sunny Chicago. So down the street from the studio. So hopefully you guys are enjoying the slew of conference coverage that's been coming at you from us lately. We had the Swan event and the big OIC conference last week. And now here we are at the trading show. So no rest for the wicked here on the network, including another round of great guests, including our next guest. He's a newcomer to the network. He is Hugh Leong, the co-founder and CEO of Omniex. Hugh, welcome to the program. Thank you, Mark. Good to be here. And as we are wont to do with all of our first timers here, why don't you go ahead and give our audience a little bit of an overview of your background and what it is you guys do at Omniex. Yeah, so for myself, um, I'm actually started out as a tech tech guy. Got into I won't the hold that against you at all. That's right, uh, since we're in Chicago and not in San Francisco. So I am <laughs> San Francisco based, started on the tech guy side, and uh, got into the financial service world in the early 2000s through a company called Kernex. And Kernex is actually quite familiar to a lot of the folks in uh, Chicago here. We're the first uh, institutionally focused large-scale electronic trading network for currencies. Um, all the investment banks were on, uh, a lot of the high-frequency traders, hedge funds, uh, corporate treasury, real money funds. So by the middle of 2000s, uh, we built a network um, that was trading between 50 to 100 billion per day of FX spot turnover. Uh, and State Street Bank and Trust acquired us in 2007. So I've been in State Street uh, the 10 years after. I ran a lot of these different businesses uh, globally, as well as four years in Asia for all of Asia Pacific. Came back to States in 2015 to start a unit within State Street called Emerging Technology Center. And the goal of the unit uh, was really to be State Street's innovation arm and focus on new technologies that, uh, that could have a long-term impact on the financial service industry. So including things like AI, robo-advisor, and of course one of the biggest things that we looked at was uh, blockchain and crypto. Uh, more from a technology perspective. But a little bit into that, a year or so into that, by about 2016, all this, a lot of the large, not certainly not all, but a lot of the large clients of State Street started asking, what is crypto? You know, is it an asset class, right? Is this something that, as multi-asset class portfolio managers, we should be thinking about? And if we do decide to do it, how do we custody it? How do we trade it? You know, what, how does credit play into this? So all of these questions that people really didn't know, and, and there was no answer for at the time. So. I left with a couple of other colleagues from the trading and institutional finance space in end of 2017 uh, to start Omniex. And our goal was to create a technology platform specifically designed for trading that has front office portfolio management, order management, uh, connectivity, algorithmic trading capability, basically a platform that look and feel very similar to what they're used to for other asset classes, but specifically tailored to a crypto asset to lower that bar for entry into this new asset class. I always like to ask everyone, you know, what their what their eureka moment was that lured them uh, to the dark side, if you will, of crypto. Sounds like yours was you kind of just saw a an opportunity there that was waiting to be filled, and you guys uh, you jumped in with both feet. Is that is that pretty much uh, I think how that's, it works? That's really that's very very correct. And also the similarities between the way crypto is traded and the, the, the structure of the mechanics of the market structure is very similar to traditional assets, actually, right? The use cases are very different, right? Blockchain and all that is hugely different. But um, in terms of trading on exchanges, in terms of OTC trading, 
you know, crypto today, whether it's Ethereum or Bitcoin, act very much like a currency commodity type product. And we have a lot of background in that space, working with the firms in Chicago and, and global entities. And we thought we had the right, uh, we were at the right time with the right opportunity and we had the right background to do it. So OmniX, walk us through it a little bit then. Is it, is it live now? Can we trade it? Are you in the capital raising stage? Uh, wh wh what are we at with OmniX? Yeah, so we formed end of 2017. And uh, so we're you know, about a year and a half into it. The platform is fully operational. Um, we have investors from the Chicago side because they were clients of our old company, so they know um, the process that we went through. And what we have designed is a system from the ground up specifically tailored to the idiosyncrasies of crypto trading. So a lot of the question that we get asked is, you know, why does an existing player just do this, right? Why don't they take a platform and just stick crypto on top of it? I think some people are doing that. And I think that the fallacy that we run into is if you look at any kind of technology infrastructure today in the financial space, minimally, it's about 15, 20 years old. Our previous company that acquired by State Street included. So for us to take an old infrastructure and really create and put something as new as and innovative as crypto on it, it's not going to serve the future, right? So what we have done is we went the path of completely building something from the ground up. So we have a EMS system that's fully built in C++. It runs in the NY5 data center and you... New Jersey, fully connected to uh, 15 of the largest uh, crypto exchanges around the world, as well as OTC providers, so that can handle microsecond latency trading when we get there, right? We're certainly not there yet. I was going to say, right? <laughs> which crypto it's, are you trading that is executing about, that quickly? It's about being future-proof, yes. right? But we also have a cloud solution that provides a full user interface that gives them portfolio management, access across exchanges, blockchain, custodians, all the way down to algorithmic order management capabilities, and actually firing those algos directly through the C++ EMS and actually getting it executed. So it's a hybrid infrastructure. It's been live for uh, since September of 2018. And so you're planning, you're not offering a specific part of the ecosystem, you're offering the whole experience soup to nuts. They can come to you, execute through your front end, you're handling the back office, all the, I'm assuming custody, all that, all those fun things, all that, all that is part of your offering? So, yes and no. So we give you the, the, the software that takes you through that whole entire chain, but we're not the destination. So we're okay. not your counterparty. We're not your custodian, but we're connected to the exchanges, we're connected to OTC, we're connected to the uh, um, custodians, we're even connected to uh, Silvergate, the, the actual banking side of things. So think of us as a software infrastructure that look and feel very much like the Charles Rivers for the asset management side or the S Castles for the hedge fund side or even something like a black lot or Latin for the fixed income side. But we provide that technology layer for the crypto side. Now the crypto markets, when you first look at them, they're obviously very daunting, but for, you know, for a vendor like you, it's also an opportunity. Obviously, you have, you have heavy fragmentation, 200 plus venues out there. You have issues with things like custody. You have issues with cybersecurity. It could be a daunting thing, but I, I imagine for you guys, those challenges, I'm assuming because you launched the firm, they seemed like opportunities that, that were uh, very, very worth pursuing. Yeah, that's exactly the case. So I, I just came off of a, 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 a talk here, and the problem statement was the fragmentation of the crypto market, right? Because institutions do not want to have to spend so much time putting all these little components together, right? They want a solution that they're familiar with that's well suited to, to, to be uh, used in front of the regulators and talk to them about and, and gives them something that they already had access to in the past. So that's what we're doing. Now, some of the fragmentation is challenging because of the number of exchanges you talked about, but generally speaking, if you look at the 80-20 rule, you don't need all the exchanges, right? You know, 10, 15% of the exchanges will give you 90% of the coverage, and we're pretty good with that. Um, but that's exactly the thing, right? We want to save time, cost, um, for the institutional investors so that they don't have to build this stuff in-house, uh, and they have something that's quality uh, and time-tested. You know, you launched this at the end of 2017. It was auspicious or perhaps inauspicious, depending, timing, depending on, on your viewpoint, because on the one hand, you launched at the height right, of, of the crypto mania, the crypto yep. frenzy out there. So certainly when you launched, I'm sure every institution was beating a path to your door. You want crypto, we want crypto. But walk us through what was it like six, eight, ten months later when we were kind of in the teeth of the, of the bear market there. Were institutions still, was the appetite still as strong or what, had it diminished a little bit? And maybe conversely, in the last month or so when it's turned up again, have you seen an uptick in, in interest as there's, a result? There's definitely been um, different market participations, right, since the end of 2017. Um, in the 2017, early 2018, you certainly had the hype, which is something that actually worried a lot of us from the institutional space. When you see something developing like this with no fundamentals behind it, 
um, and guys like Jamie Dimon saying this is a fraud, yes. you know this is not a good thing. <laughs> Who right? then launched his own coin, what, less than a year later? Absolutely. I think what's, what's been a very uh, persistent across this whole time is that the, the, the true believers and the newer folks that are coming in that are very sophisticated guys believe in the long run that this is a new asset class, right? And the talk that I just gave earlier is specifically about what is the intrinsic value of crypto. It's very different between the intrinsic value of crypto in the retail space and the institutional space. I think for the institutional space, it is a new asset class. Whereas for the retail space, you can have decentralized Ubers, you can have decentralized Facebook potentially that are not mutually exclusive, they both can exist, um, that adds a lot of different values in the future. And because of this fundamental value, then for the long, asset managers, this should be an asset you want to hold, right? Which is the tokens that underlies the blockchain. I think that fundamental thesis has not changed at all. The, real, the reality that we all came to is that it takes longer for us to create a decentralized Uber. It takes longer to create a decentralized Dropbox, right? It doesn't happen overnight. So a lot of the folks who raised the money, who created these ICOs, unfortunately are, were not able to deliver what they promised in the time frame that they promised. So that's what really caused this thing to fall. And for the people in the know, we know that this takes some time to get through. And I think that hasn't changed. The, the overall volumes, the, the fact that people think, you know, in institutional investments and, and pension funds are all going to be pouring into it immediately, that certainly has changed, right? We know it's going to take longer, but this also is an opportunity because it gives us a time to build out the requisite infrastructure for it to happen. I mean, we saw what happened in the 2017 when everybody started trading it, even on the retail side. All the exchanges were falling over. If that happened on the institutional side and the system wasn't there, that's a much, much bigger issue, right, when things start falling over. So now we have the time to actually make everything bulletproof, test through the system, make sure the transactions are good, flowing from end to end. So it's a perfect time for building right now. Very few people who play on the institutional side of the crypto space say that the institutions are saying one thing publicly and doing something very different behind the scenes, where maybe in public they're saying, we're not really that interested in crypto, we're not ready for it. Behind the scenes they're staffing up, they're planning for it as if it's going to, to come to fruition. Are you seeing that as well? Is that kind of what you're seeing in the space? I, I think that's very, very much the case. I think a lot of bigger institutions, you know, treat an opportunity like this um, as something that doesn't come very often, right? And they want to make sure they have the edge uh, when it does become bigger. So I think if you look at what Fidelity is doing in terms of creating digital assets and the number of people they already put there, it is pretty significant. Um, you know, everybody, I think from, uh, you know, we've been in the internet world. Everything seems to happen instantaneously. So the fact that, you know, these large uh, institution have not yet overnight turned on something new like this. Um, to some people say, well, this is, this is a clear indication that they fail. No, they haven't failed, right? They're just taking the time to get it done and get it done right. And if you compare that to the history of other developed markets or asset classes, we're still moving at a rate that's much, much faster. So we just all have to be a little patient, um, you know, and get through this winter. And you mentioned everyone, I've heard crypto winter so many times today. It's a great term. Yes. I think some of it, everyone has a Game of Thrones on the brain with winter, <laughs> right? But uh, it, it is a great term. But we're obviously, we're here in Chicago at the trading show. You mentioned you just got off a panel. Is that why you're here? Or do you guys have some announcements? What is it that brings you to uh, Chicago today? Really, a lot of uh, our target client segments are here. Um, you know, whether it's the, the capital markets world, or the traditional long-only funds world, those are all our clients. And I think in this world that we're in Chicago are a lot of the active funds. So we have a lot of old clients, we have new clients, we have investors here. This is the perfect place to showcase the product that we have developed, meet with the people that we haven't seen in a long time, and basically come to a very convenient place where everybody can share and uh, pull the market together. True, it is, it is a very convenient place uh, from that perspective. Well, we touched on a lot of different interesting areas here. But before we wrap up, we'd like to leave, leave our audience wanting more, leave them with a little bit of a hint, a little bit of a tease perhaps of what they can expect from you guys in the coming months. So if you have anything up your sleeve, you want to dangle in front of our audience there, a little bit of a hint of what they can expect from you guys at OmniX in the coming months, now is the time, sir, the floor is yours. Yeah, so rather than telling you something that's, uh, that's dangling something, I'll tell you something that we just released, right? Okay. We actually just released a product called Executable Streaming Prices. So this is a concept that existed in the FX world, right? FX is a non-regulated product, so people can trade on a bilateral basis. So all the investment banks have the ability, as well as non-banks, have the ability to price two-sided streams. And you can essentially trade it like an exchange almost, except you're settling on a bilateral credit line. Um, this kind of stuff today in the crypto world is essentially done through the telephone, right? You have OTC markets, you pick up the phone, you keep a chat. We always thought that's really interesting because you, you have now the first truly digital asset class ever 
but yet we're gone back 20, 30 years in terms of trading technology and trading over the telephone. Yes. So we just created, we just released electronic and executable streaming prices for crypto. So we have various different OTC market makers that are streaming two-sided prices, shows up on your screen. If you have those relationship established already, you can see them electronically, hit them as very similarly how you've done it before in the FX world. And I think over time, this will be pretty revolutionary for this market. That is interesting. Yeah, people want that. They want to be able to execute, see what they can see, and execute without any of the hassles in between. Right, so. and not necessarily dealing with a retail exchange that they don't really know who's sitting yes. the orders behind it. <laughs> yes, that's true. Well, who listeners are intrigued, they want to learn more what you guys are doing at OmniX, where should they go, what should they do? Certainly hit us on our website, OmniX, uh, O-M-N, N-I-E-X dot com, uh, sorry, dot I-O. All the new startups have to use All the cool ones are dot I-O. I had a dot capital in here a little while ago. That's the first time I had seen that. So That's probably a venture dot com, fund of some Dot com sort. is old school. That's right. Uh, or our LinkedIn page <laughs> is certainly there as well. We have, uh, we're staffed in San Francisco and uh, L.A. We're in Chicago and New York quite often, so we love to hear from people. Great. Thanks for coming on. We'll look forward to seeing how all this unfolds in the marketplace in the coming months. Thanks for having me on, Mark. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.